I'm okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So welcome everybody to the session on detection and diagnosis for short orals. Um, just to remind you, we have nine short oral papers. Uh, we will divide them into groups of three, uh, three papers each, and we will have 15 minutes for each of those three sessions. Um, the speakers uh, will be asked to introduce themselves. They have 90 seconds to introduce themselves and they can share a slide. And then after they introduce themselves, we will have a panel discussion. Uh, where we will accept questions from the chat, questions, um, if you, live questions, you can raise your hand if you want to have live questions, and we have some questions from the study group. So with that, um, I hand over uh, the mic to Han. Yes, and the first speaker will be Tian Yu Zhang. Um, please, the stage is yours. We can't hear you yet. Not working. It's muted. You are not displayed as muted. muted. Now. Hello. No. Uh, now it works. Okay. Can hear the microphone. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tian Yu Zhang, a PhD candidate uh, in Netherlands Cancer Institute. Yeah. Uh, and uh, our short, uh, short paper is uh, predicting molecular subtypes of breast cancer uh, using multimodal deep learning and the incorporation uh, of the attention mechanism. And according to different receptors, uh, breast cancer can be divided into uh, four uh, molecular subtypes. Uh, this is an, a very important factor uh, for the prognosis uh, of breast cancer patients and uh, can guide uh, the treatment uh, selection. Yeah, so in this work, our uh, purpose is to uh, develop a deep learning based model uh, for predicting uh, the molecular subtypes uh, using multimodal uh, image analysis. Uh, combining uh, mammography and the ultrasound. Uh, so for, uh, for our model, uh, we combine uh, resonate and the attention mechanism uh, as the uh, feature uh, extractor. Uh, so the study part uh, is the uh, results. Uh, the MCC uh, was 0 0.794 uh, for predicting uh, molecular subtypes. And the AOC uh, was uh, 0 0.855 uh, for distinguishing uh, luminal and non-luminal disease. And uh, finally, uh, we also uh, generated uh, heat maps uh, using the uh, class activation mapping uh, method. Uh, it can be seen uh, that our model uh, focuses on uh, the information of the leader uh, of uh, mammography and the ultrasound images. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so that was the first of uh, the three speakers in the first batch. Uh, now, please, uh, I would like to hand over the mic to Yu Hen Yang. Okay, hello. Uh, can anybody hear you? Yeah, we can hear you fine, thanks. Um, okay, so hi, my name is Yu uh, Chen Yang. I'm a master's student from the University of Alberta. Um, so our presenting work today is about the domain shift problem that exists in the host site image classification test. Uh, so the domain shift issue could cause accuracy drop when you train the model based on one data collection and you test them uh, to another. So uh, in the same time, the high resolution and the high labeling cost of the whole slide image also create difficulties uh, when you are trying to overcome this problem. So uh, our work is basically uh, providing an unsupervised domain adaptation solution uh, to our previous work on the whole slide image classification. Uh, in our previous work, we proposed an end-to-end -end embedding-based method to predict the single label 
like HER2 score uh, from the HER2 channel for each of the entire host site image. So built on the previous pipeline, we propose to integrate the domain classifier into two stages to cover uh, both the local and global distribution shift during the end-to-end uh, -end training process. So we followed a uh, classic experiment setting that compare adapted and the supervised model. And we found that our proposed double adversarial uh, pipeline shows a, a significant accuracy boost when adapting from a large data set to a smaller data set to predict the hard to score for each image. So yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. Yeah, and thank you for the brief introduction of your work. And uh, now I would like to hand over to Francesco for the third talk. You still have to unmute, I guess. You see the slide though. Now we hear you. We could see the slide fine a moment ago. Oh, I think we lost this speaker. At least he's gone from my attendee list. Happened. Issues. Let's just give him a second and see if it's fixed. Hmm. We could also deviate from the schedule and. Yeah, no, he's back. Uh, he's back. Sorry, I couldn't find the uh, option to share the screen. So, sorry, to unmute myself so I had to close the. A WebEx. So. It's perfect now. Thank Go you ahead. very much. I'm very honored to be uh, attending Middle 21 and introduce our work on virtual bone shape aging on behalf of my team. Uh, my name is Francesco Cariva and I'm a postdoc at UCSF. Neosteratralis is a, uh, a debilitating disease in which bone shape is a very uh, important role. In fact, it's considered a relevant biomarker. And in this study, we aim to explore the use of deep learning to predict bone shape changes in a time frame of 48 months on subject with and without osteoarthritis. For this, starting from the three from 3D MRIs, we segment uh, the femur and the tibia bones, and then the segmentation is converted into a 3D mesh um, of the bone surface, and then this is encoded in spherical coordinates to obtain an image like this one uh, shown on the right. And given the spherical maps computed at three different time points, these are concatenated channel wise and fed into a 2D vignette, which has the task to um, learn the trajectory of shape changes in four years. And uh, our model shows that it is able to predict local changes in the bone shape, as we can see here in this uh, uh, intercondylar notch, uh, notch of the uh, femur or uh, in the trochlea. For uh, more uh, uh, questions, uh, feel free to ask at the end of the session or just visit my cluster. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your talk and all three speakers for uh, pretty much staying in time. Um, now we have uh, a few minutes for questions. Um, so please uh, type your questions in the chat. Uh, Best prefixed with uh, D4, D5, or D6. And uh, we can start with questions from the study group earlier today. So the first question may be for Tian Yu about the molecular subtypes of breast cancer. Um, you, you did this uh, heat mapping experiment. Um, what, what kind of insights could you uh, derived from that uh, with respect to the image features that that are responsible for the decisions.
you're you're muted. Uh, you have to unmute. Uh, hello. Uh, you mean the uh, uh, visualization part, right? The heat map. Yes, uh, it's about which, what kind, so the question is what, uh, what insights did you have, do you have about the image features that lead to the decisions about the molecular subtypes? I thought you probably get oh, that from the heat mapping. I'm mute again. Sorry for the internet. Um, did you understand the question? Uh, uh, hello. The, yeah. Okay. Okay. I couldn't hear you. Okay. Uh, you mean uh, how to uh, divide it into? Uh, for class uh, molecular subtypes, right? Yes. Yeah, we just uh, based on um, the uh, receptors. Yeah, you can see uh, HR, ER, uh, PR, and uh, HER2. Yeah. And uh, then uh, the protein uh, expression levels is very uh, also important uh, uh, for this uh, because you can see that. Uh, uh, such as KI six uh, seven, uh, if uh, the uh, levels uh, is low, maybe uh, will uh, divide it into uh, lumino A. Uh, if the uh, level of KI six seven is high, this uh, will divide it into uh, lumino B. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, this this work uh, is based on the uh, radiologists, yeah, uh, used to find the uh, label of our work. Okay, so I guess I, I would have follow-up questions, but in the interest of time, we should go on to to also have a question for the other speakers. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so in the chat, there was a question from Matthias Heinrich for the next speaker, uh, Yuxian Yang, uh, about the advantages of using the rather classical Fisher vector encoding within a deep neural network. Can you elaborate on that? What was the reason for the right. choice? Right, so uh, yes, when we were thinking about this problem, it's basically uh, if you are looking at our previous work, we are First, uh, sampling patches from the original fossa images, and then uh, feed uh, feed them to a feature encoding uh, feature encoding stage, um, and then after that, we want to figure out a way to uh, minimize the length of the feature encoding because fossa image has a very large size, and it has so many patches, and if we want to fit into the GPU, we have to uh, we have to make it a uh, very short uh, feature presentation time. Uh, so, feature uh, in this in this stage, uh, our previous work chose to use the feature vector, um, and they simply give us a better result when we do the end -to end to end training at the end. So I think it's uh, it's the best that you can uh, search on our uh, previous paper on the reference or in our poster. Does this answer your question? Yeah, it uh, answers the question of Matthias Heinrich. Uh, he said thanks in the chat. So thank you as well. And maybe then uh, a last question uh, for the third speaker. Um, I think there was one in the chat as well. Um, or maybe I should rather take uh, another one. Um, so how how large are the bone shape changes that are um, that are uh, measured over this time frame and uh, uh, and pre represented with this spherical map? 
So the bone shape changes are actually uh, very small, and that makes the uh, problem really challenging because even if um, the model was to uh, predict an error, sorry, a change very small, like let's say predicting always zero as a change, it would get a very small error. So uh, changes are always in the range of uh, less than millimeter size in most of the time. Uh, but uh, so a way that you can, what you want to do is to ensure that you are actually capturing the change of shape. So you can see if there is no correlation between uh, changes, uh, larger change of shape and uh, error. So if the, the, this correlation is missing, then it means that you are actually capturing the change. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, we need to go on um, with this session. So um, I have two more questions, but uh, we should uh, then clarify those uh, in the poster session. And with that, I will pass the mic back to Tal. Okay, thank you. So um, let's invite the next group of three speakers and um, invite you to introduce yourselves. Um, so let's start with uh, Ansh. Thank you. I hope you hear me well. Okay. Uh, so I'll just present our work on uh, using image analysis to detect lymphocytes on HER2 stained IHC sections and do uh, patient stratification on a breast cancer cohort. Uh, my name is Ansh Kapil and I'm a part of AstraZeneca Computational Pathology. We are based in Munich. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Is it possible to move to the next slide? Can I can I share my screen instead, if possible? Yeah, I think it's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, is my screen visible? Not yet. No. Um, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is okay. Yes. Okay. So perfect. Yeah, in this work, we just uh, traditionally uh, the the task of lymphocyte detection is done on HNDs with the morphological stain. Uh, in this work, we would try to do this on an IHC stain. So basically, you have these blue nuclei, and there's no pink involved in this case. Um, the advantage of doing this on a HER2 section is basically you can do uh, spatial statistics afterwards, like uh, distance of tails to tumor cells, and that's why we want to use the same stain uh, for both lymphocyte detection as well as the um, analysis of tumor cells. And once we have these lymphocytes quantified, we want to do patient stratification. So basically, we want to see if high stromal tail density uh, belongs to better survival of the patients. Uh, for this task, we used, uh, we augmented the cycle GAN architecture uh, with a style encoder. So here you have, you see an HND as an input where your, and then the style image is an IHC her to image and then in the end we get some synthetic patches which to train on uh, the final unit model and we train the final unit model for lymphocytes we do clinical uh, analytical validation against pathologists as well as um, against the hnd sections corresponding consecutive hnd sections and finally we also do clinical validation on a breast cancer cohort where we see image analysis based uh, stromal tail density uh, correlates to survival, higher survival. Uh, please let me know for any questions and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Um, and we'll go on to the next speaker, Bram. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, then next up, I will share the screen. So you should see the presentation now, right? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Let's see. Uh, now I yes. think. 
Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'll quickly tell something about the work that I submitted, uh, which is about sign MRI detection of abdominal adhesions with spatial temporal deep learning. Um, so for this, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I'll first just dive right in uh, and show you what the data looks like. Um, so this is sign MRI that I'm working with. Uh, patients are asked to uh, breathe basically while they're in the MRI and the task of the radiologist is to detect whether there's an adhesion. Uh, so you can already see the title, you can you can give it a shot yourself. Um, so you're looking some for something that sticks together where it's not supposed to. Uh, and this is actually the example. So you can see that the left patient is a normal one where everything inside the abdomen moves. On the right, you can see it sort of sticks together. Uh, but I think this also highlights that it's quite a, a difficult task. Um, so we've made some first steps in uh, attacking this with deep learning. Um, so uh, maybe a little bit about the data. We have uh, 104 of these videos that I just showed with a binary label. Um, and what we try is uh, both a ResNet 18 as a baseline, where we simply uh, provide two frames as a two-channel image. And then the full architecture that we tried is that we added a convolutional gated recurrent unit on top, that's a recurrent neural network, um, to process these in time. Um, and in the end, we have a fully connected layer to go to a classification score. Um, and we show that it uh, is actually significantly better than this baseline that we did. Um, so we conclude that temporal modeling works for this task, which makes sense because it's video data. And it's only 5% uh, of the weights of the baseline. Um, and in the future, we hope to extend this towards detection and localization with maybe saliency maps um, or detection heads, something like that. Uh, so thanks. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for that uh, interesting introduction. Uh, our final speaker is Jonathan Rubin. He had to reconnect, so he needs to become panelist again. He has his hand raised. Ah, okay. Hope he didn't misunderstand me. Oh, he's there. So I see him now as a panelist. There we go. Re enter Gaddis now. Ah, okay, great. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you. Your, Hopefully your you can see my up. yeah. Screen. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm Jonathan Rubin. Um, I come from Phillips Research uh, in the United States. This is work that I did with um, some colleagues, and it is about uh, ultrasound-guided needle insertion. So this is a common um, medical ultrasound application uh, where the idea here is that we want to be able to de detect where a needle is in a an ultrasound frame, and this becomes an easier task uh, if we can use video, if we can use temporal information. Um, <clears throat> and after detecting where the needle is, we'd like to be able to use this information to alter the steering parameters on the ultrasound device so that we can better visualize a needle for a user. We looked at three approaches in this work, um, a 2D baseline approach, uh, a 2.5D approach that uh, uses a a two-stream type network that has motion and image information, and then a full 3D uh, spatio-temporal convolutional approach. Um, and then we also looked at three separate um, improvements to these different approaches, including spatial and temporal data augmentation, utilizing focal loss instead of cross entropy, um, as well as imposing a geometric prior. And we see that uh, for average precision and other metrics, uh, as we go from 2D to 3D and add in these improvements, we get uh, better uh, scores, uh, especially for some challenging use cases such as uh, short and steep needle insertions. So, thank you very much. Thank you to our 
speakers. Um, we are ready to take questions on the chat or um, from the audience live. So um, let's start with Bram, uh, paper D8. Uh, you have a question from Juan Carlos Prieto. The question is, uh, is the ResNet 18 using pre-trained weight or is it trained end-to-end -end and have you tested the approach using other networks? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so when we use the ResNet 18 standalone as a baseline, um, it is uh, trained from scratch. Uh, when we use it indeed with the recurrent neural network, we use it um, pre-trained uh, on our task labels. So we basically use the baseline network and then strip off the final layers. Um, and then the second part of your question, uh, we have at the moment not yet tested uh, other networks, but that's for sure uh, in the future plans. And that goes also for the recurrent uh, module actually. Okay, great. I have a quick question. Just uh, you mentioned that in the future you'd like to work on saliency maps. Do you have any mm -hmm. comments as to what type of saliency map you would consider to make this interpretable and again this is future work i know yeah yeah so um the, the technical details i've not brushed up completely mm -hmm. but i know of these uh approaches like uh, gradcam is a is a popular one where you um uh, i guess you go all the way from your label back uh back to the beginning to to see where your model uh has the most influence so i'm not sure if with recurrent networks that's super easy but um that, that's one of the approaches. Of course, you can also attach maybe a more like a bounding box prediction type uh, part at the end of the model to make it more towards a detector. Uh, if you keep it as a classification pipeline, I guess you have to do something like this saliency. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we have some questions for Jonathan. Maybe I'll start with uh, what type of temporal augmentation do you use? I know you mentioned it in the in the paper, but maybe you could talk a bit about it. Uh, the temporal augmentation. So for that, we basically did things like flipping around the the time, the axis of time, and also doing um, some sort of dilation of uh, the time information. So we would uh, repeat uh, a frame of ultrasound drop, so the frames in the middle, but repeat it so that it kind of uh, compresses and dilates the time in between. Okay, thank you. Um, we have uh, two follow on questions. Uh, one of them is um, uh, related to the um, question if the needle insertion procedures are similar enough to be represented in what you had it during training. So the question is training clips were acquired ex vivo and the geometric prior penalizes predictions far away from known pose distributions derived from training labels. So I guess just a bit of a question about generalizability and, and if your training samples capture uh, enough of the sure. visibility. So yeah, I think to answer this, basically we spent a lot of effort in when we split up um, the data, thinking about the different sort of acquisition parameters and um, the different types of tissues that we acquired and try to really get a um, testing and validation sets that were um, diverse and sort of representative. Um, and that's how we've, uh, I guess, attempted to ensure that we generalize appropriately um, to any sort of new data that we might encounter and that things like the geometric prior uh, hopefully generalize well to, to other data that we might see. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, yes, yes. Um, I guess in the interest of time, just a quick question. For um, an Ansh, um, a very interesting talk also, and I'm just wondering. Um, there was a question uh, about your survival prognosis. So, does it really? I guess the question was: Does it validate the accuracy of the detection, meaning the actual locations, or just the general density? So, both were done. So, if you see, uh, there is a Spearman correlation done against the actual counts. There's mm -hmm. also the F1 score done with a 10 pixel threshold, which is basically detecting the exact location. So both were done. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, I invite everybody to uh, go to the poster session in Gathertown afterwards and, uh, and go ahead and ask the remaining questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So with that, we'll go to the last three speakers and I'll hand over the mic to Hans. That will be Dominic Meyerhofer. Um, please, you have uh, 90 seconds to introduce your work. We can see the slides properly. We don't hear you yet. Sorry, no. Yes. <clears throat> um, I'm Dominic Meyerhofer, and as a team consisting of the Institute for Neuroenvironmentalics um, of the University of Lübeck, the Pattern Recognition Company, and the University Medical Center Schleswig-Holstein and Image Information Systems Europe, we developed an AI based framework for diagnostic quality assessment of anchor radiographs. We did this because the diagnostic quality of radiographs is of major importance for diagnosis. Um, but up to right now, the quality is often assessed based on features like noise or contrast. Um, but as you can see here, um, these features are useless if the patient is not correctly lined relative to an X-ray machine. So um, for the ankle radiographs, this is important um, for diagnosis that the joint gaps um, are clearly visible here. And um, here from the left to the right, um, the alignment of the patient gets better and therefore the diagnostic quality rises. And this is why we want to assess the diagnostic image quality instead of just the image quality. And to tackle this problem for ankle radiographs, um, we first created a data set of ankle radiographs with their quality labeled by four radiologists based on this criteria. And then we developed a framework consisting of um, three steps. And in the first step, um, we classify the radiographic view of our input radiograph. And based on the result of this, we then extract the region of interest. And this cropped radiograph is then fed in our final quality assessment network, which predicts the diagnostic quality. And we could show that with our framework, we could assess the quality on the same level of expertise as radiologists. Thank you for your attention, and we are looking forward to your questions. Great, thank you. So uh, the next speaker will be Juan Carlos Prieto. Lights are visible from Johanna. Um, I think we lost this or is it my connection? Um, I don't see the speaker. Maybe we can go to the third one and go back to one. Oh, there it is. Okay. Juan, Juan Carlos is there again, so if you can unmute. We can start. Yes, perfect. I'm sorry. I just the option. Um, oh wait, I. Is this um, which screen I'm sharing? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's the presenter mode. Yeah. Um, share screen to this one. Yes. Okay, that's better. Okay. Um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Juan Carlos. I'm going to present. Uh, Image sequence analysis via uh, gated recurring units and attention for uh, trachomatous trachiasis classification. Um, this work is being done in collaboration between the University of North Carolina and RTI International. Um, mm -hmm. So, here the idea is that um, uh, so trachomatous trachiasis is, is a uh, is an infectious disease that is the world leading cause of blindness in the world. And uh, we want to uh, optimize how uh, this uh, assessment is being done. So it's usually, uh, uh, so the study is being conducted in Ethiopia, and there are usually like surgical camps that go to different places, and they invite people to come to the surgical camps. But the people that are doing the assessment, they don't have um, a lot of the times the skills required, um, or you know they they don't have good assessment or how to identify the the disease 
So we are trying to develop an application that will be mobile and that uh, can be used to uh, help uh, assessment of, of this condition. So in, uh, I will give more details about the network that we are using. So uh, here the idea is that we're going to take these images and we are going to create this segmentation, this label map. Uh, we are going to basically fit a curve in that region and we're going to create this image sequence that then we are going to feed to our neural network that is composed of a feature extraction uh, layer. So here we uh, tested different uh, networks. And then uh, the following step is feeding those features to uh, our bidirectional gated recurrent um, units. And then we use uh, an attention layer that will help basically locate uh, what which parts of the or which frames in the sequence is paying paying attention to. Um, Can I ask so, you to come to the end now? Yes. So um, here is, for example, uh, an example of the sequence that is generated. Uh, here is an uh, example of the label maps that are created. And here we can see uh, the frames that the, the sequence is generated. And we can see that is actually selecting frames that have uh, the condition that it, it may be related to just a few eyelashes. Uh, and this application is uh, now we are developing the mobile application and it will be tested soon in the field. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the brief talk. And uh, let's go on with the last talk of this session by Hari Sovri Rayan. Sorry for the pronunciation. Hi. Um, can I share my screen? We can already see something. Okay. Oh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Please let's let's try to be yeah, fast please. so that yeah, we have sure. time yeah. for questions. Yep. So hi guys. Uh, my name is Hari. I'm an undergrad slash master student at Stanford. I'll be representing the work MoCo CXR, MoCo pre-training improves representation and transferability of chest X-ray models. So the task uh, we're, we're trying to deal with here is that of chest X-ray interpretation. It's the most widely used and important medical imaging technique. And deep learning techniques have been made possible recently by the release of large labeled data sets like Chexpert and Shenzhen. Uh, but frequently, uh, these data sets are very hand curated. They're high quality X-rays and they have high quality labels. So it's not clear that models trained with these data sets uh, will have strong performance on X-rays seen in the wild and unseen pathologies. So we seek to apply contrastive learning, which has never been applied to this task, to get models with better representations, capable of performing with less labeled data and generalizing better to pathologies that we have not seen yet. And we seek to use the uh, momentum contrastive learning technique uh, just because it's achieved pretty competitive performance recently uh, as an extension of the base contrastive learning framework. So our pipeline involved altering the MoCo pre-training setup to be more conducive to chest x-rays. And we found that after pre-training our models on Chexpert and uh, then subsequently fine-tuning them on Chexpert uh, test data sets, uh, we were able to show that uh, both linear as well as end-to-end -end models perform better on Chexpert uh, relative to ImageNet pre-trained baselines with MoCo pre-training. Uh, this indicates that we've uh, produced better representations and initializations for our models. Uh, we also showed that we were able to transfer models that were pre-trained on Chexpert uh, to perform better on an external data set that was not seen during the pre-training. And this indicates that our models are more generalizable and will generalize to pathologies that might not have been in our training data set. Uh, so overall, this suggests uh, that we were able to adapt MoCo to our new task, despite numerous differences between natural images and chest x-rays, and this suggests applications to other medical imaging tasks that have scarce labeled data, but abundant unlabeled data. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we have about five minutes left for questions for the last three speakers. Um, if you haven't uh, entered your question yet in the chat, please do so. Um, let's start with the questions that are already there. For instance, at, uh, for Dominic Meyerhofer, the question, um, uh, is there a straightforward way to judge the diagnostic quality, both in terms of anatomical appearance, like in your work, and the noise contrast that you mentioned at the beginning of your slides. And actually, the question starts with cool work. 
Yeah. <laughs> Um, according according to the radiologists which were involved, um, the the features like noise and contrast getting less important with modern digital radiography. But I'm sure one can use um, existing approaches for such features and include it in framework. Maybe one brief follow up question because you answered so fast. Uh, could the training also be done end to end because you have several networks, one after the other? Um, yeah, uh, it, it should be, but uh, we, we are going to try it um, in the future. Um, it is not so easy, um, but uh, it's it's on our uh, roadmap. Okay, thank you. So um, then I have a few questions. Oh, let's uh, maybe go on with the next speaker. Um, the question is, why do you opt for a recurrent neural network um, when the sequential relation between the regions of interest is not important? That was a similar question I also had. Um, so the, this is based on, uh, so we, I mean, we, we are generating in some sense or creating uh, a smooth video sequence. And we noticed that, I mean, the, the good input uh, to this type of, uh, of video would be uh, like a recurrent network. And it does uh, seem, so th with the attention mechanism, it does seem to, uh, to cluster, you know, the frames that are together. So. I think the question is, uh, why do you generate a video? Uh, couldn't you also, um, to, uh, implement a network that just looks at uh, the still image because the video is generated from a still image. Yeah, so uh, one of the reasons of, of this is because we want to use uh, like the maximum resolution possible in the images. So these are images captured by commercial phones. And we did try, um, so in the paper, there are more details about the experiments that we did. So one of the first experiments that we did was just resample the image to a smaller resolution and then just train a, a network, a classification network. But, uh, from the results, we saw that uh, just focu focusing on the eyelash uh, gave us better better uh, separation between the between the condition. Uh, although, if, if we use like um, just the resample images, we may be getting more features from from other parts of the eye, the uh, uh, the sclera or the cornea. But now only focusing on the eyelid, which is actually um, let's say one of the uh, requirements or, or how the, the disease is recognized by the World Health, Health Organization is only focusing on the eyelash. So we don't want also, that was one of the of the ideas that we thought it was it was good to uh, have in the, in the implementation is that we focus as much as possible only in the eyelid region. See, um, I think, uh, yeah, there are some follow-up questions also by uh, Laura Franziska Graf, who has asked this, uh, but maybe we should postpone that for the poster session and instead have a final um, round of questions also for the last speaker um, about the MOCO pre training for um, chest X ray models. Um, so, one question was uh, which adaptations were needed for going from natural images to chest X ray? Because you mentioned in your talk that uh, you had to. To adaptations. Yeah. So, uh, can you guys hear me? I assume you can. Yeah. Um, basically, what we were doing with the MoCo pre-training set is we had to alter number one the model initialization for the pre-training. Um, so, like we found that initialization by scratch was not the best uh, initialization. Uh, we had to sort of initialize with some uh, other weights uh, inspired by ImageNet. Um, we also found that we had to use augmentations that were clinically relevant. Uh, for example, like a Gaussian blur uh, would kind of really screw up a chest x-ray. The pathologies wouldn't be visible, so we had to make those uh, more clinically relevant. And uh, we also had to had to highly optimize learning rates. Uh, I think we found that much lower learning rates and batch sizes were necessary to uh, train on, on x-ray images. Would the bias in training data impact the diversity of uh, negative samples? Possibly. Was it... 
Um, I think possibly. I think the the way we dealt with the negative sampling uh, was just with the MOCOs and the, the negative Q that it uses. Uh, so our goal was just basically the fact that we we have a small batch size, but MOCO decouples Q size from uh, from the overall dictionary means that we can cover a pretty diverse set of negative samples. Uh, so that was sort of why we chose to use MOCO, so we could sort of get more bang for our buck there with the amount of negative samples we used. Okay. So, uh, Tal, do you want to have a final word as well? So, I think we I need to, to close thank, the session. Yeah, I just wanted to thank all of our speakers for very interesting talks. I encourage everybody to come to the poster session and continue the discussions. Um, and so, uh, oops, let's just thank our speakers together and um, we'll meet you all at GatherTown. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.